Today's film has been billed as Demons 3 for decades, but it's really something far more interesting. Welcome to Sick Flicks, where I take a deep dive into the cinematic sewer to help you embrace your inner gore geek. I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, and today we're tackling McKelly Suave's underappreciated gothic chiller, The Church. Released in 1989 and marketed as Demons 3, The Church really has very little to do with Lamberto Bava's two Demons films. Suave didn't want to make a Demons 3, so producer Dario Argento and team came up with a script that has little nods to Bava's films, but is a much slower, somber, and more thoughtful gothic horror experience. The church does have people turning into demons while trapped in a building, but it takes nearly an hour to get to those scenes. Prior to that, Suave creates a hazy, nightmare-like narrative filled with compelling visuals, interesting ideas, and some great music from Keith Emerson, Goblin, and Philip Glass. If you go in expecting Demons 3, the church can be a bit underwhelming, but if you take it on its own terms, it's arguably Suave's most underrated creation. It feels like a companion piece to Argento's Inferno, another film that often gets unfairly maligned by association. But enough about that. The real question is, is the church splattery? Let's get to the gore and find out. Oh, and before we get started, today's video is brought to you by patrons Brian Mills, King Wicked, and Fernando Pombiero. Sorry if I butchered your name, Fernando. You can help sponsor a video by joining the Patreon. Link in the description and pinned comment below. And now, on with the show. We fade in on the most ominous sounding credits in history. Seriously, I'm terrified, and this is just a list of names. Here's Barbara Cupisti, making her third appearance on the channel. She was in Stage Fright and Opera previously. And look out, it's John Morgan, aka Giovanni Lombardo Radice, making his 8 millionth appearance on the show. And the return of Asia Argento, or Asia if you're fancy. We last saw her in Demons 2. We need two screens for the writers on this one, always a good sign. This isn't even all of them. Lamberto Bava and Italian screenwriting AI Darno Sacchetti both did uncredited work here as well. Then we jump over here to... Michele Suave's Lady Hawk? Not gonna lie, I'd watch Michele Suave's Italian knockoff of Lady Hawk. At any rate, these knights are late to their meeting. Better hoof it. Also, I like that the horses are wearing masks. All the better to hide their long faces. They eventually arrive at Iron Maiden's house. I mean, the house number totally gives it away. <laughs> this way. And I gotta say, it's probably a bad idea to just put 666 right out on the front door if you're a devil worshipper in the Middle Ages. Anyway, Gollum here leads them inside to show them his precious. This way! Follow me! But instead, they find these ladies. <laughs> Wait a minute, did Quentin Tarantino direct this movie? This guy was probably hoping she was going to offer him Excalibur, but he gets lake water instead. Templar Thor takes off his mask and she's like, is your name Sriracha? Because you're the hottest knight of the round table. Rawr. Then they share a touching moment. And by touching, I mean he crushes her skull like a grape. <laughs> oh yeah, this is definitely a Tarantino movie. Look how excited he is by these feet. Apparently she had some corns or something because next thing you know, they're killing everyone. It's like Battle of the Bands in here, Iron Maiden versus the Pillage people. Then we get a cameo from the Wicker Man, who appears to be sneaking away with a baby. Probably Damien. After the slaughter, they load up the corpses. You really could call this a meat wagon, and then they dump them in this mass grave. And you know these guys were hardcore, they even killed the duck. Half-lack! Meanwhile, the Wicker Man is being chased by the slowest horse ever. He's like, I knew there was something rattan in the state of Denmark. The chase ends and the wicker man is a wicker girl. Yeah, that's Dario Argento's youngest daughter. Over at the church building, raising the cross is going great. Yeah, steady, here, or yeah, I guess that'll work too. Then we take this cool reverse shot up through the building. Oh hey, Giovanni Lombardo Radice! Meanwhile, Thomas Arana shows up for his first day of work. Why does this feel like a Mentos commercial? The Freshmaker. He heads for his office, but he's being creeped on by Lottie. 
dubbed by Bart Simpson. Hello. Hello. Who are you? You're not a priest. Seriously, what the hell is with this voice? Their meeting is interrupted when Emperor Palpatine shows up to complain Evan is milking the clock. It's your first day, and you're already late. This Death Star isn't going to build itself, you know. Then Palpatine begins the sermon. Once more, the Sith shall rule the galaxy. While that's going on, Evan is over here working on his plan to kill Whitney Houston without Kevin Costner getting in the way. Do you kids even remember the bodyguard? Christ, I'm old. And back downstairs, there's a problem with the restoration work. We have a problem. Look at these cracks. Wow, she's an art expert and a proctologist? I bet her student loans are insane. Heh, <laughs> great. They not only have cracks in the foundation, now they've got water leaks too. What a dump. Later on, she's down here fingering the cracks. Hell yeah. No, not like that, you pervs. I mean the crack in the wall. Man, this place really is falling apart. They're called Chip and Joanna Gaines because this place is a fixer-upper. She's digging around in there and finds this map. Don't you understand, Evan? We can find One-Eyed Willie's treasure. We'll be rich. Of course, Palpatine shows up. He's all like, I sure hope you're gonna tithe at least 20% of that to the Empire. Evan then gives her a ride home, and we learn why he's still single. Nobody knows except you and me. Anyway, I did recognize one thing. The symbol of the Teutonic Knights. Does the old Teutonic Knights line ever work on the ladies? Well, apparently it does. Later on, he's examining the parchment. Clearly, he's a real expert on this stuff. Smoking and open flames around ancient documents is just how it's done. Then he's back to lecturing. Just think what might be buried under these cathedrals. Things stolen from the Holy Land. Treasure. Yeah, or mass graves. I mean, same, same. And later, he cracks the case. A stone with seven eyes. I've got to find a stone with seven eyes. Back in our other movie, our priests are definitely not scoring, but are having a riveting conversation. I wonder whether you can suggest a Latin quotation for my sermon. Ah, of course. How about, you're in good hands with Allstate. Meanwhile, Lottie sneaks her way right into this pimp hand. The next morning, Lisa's trying to make her escape, but Evan's not taking the hint. Look, I'm just not that into you. Also, I love that the murals in this church look like they were inspired by the paintings on the side of some metalhead's van. Lisa, who really looks like Budget Dana Scully here, is ready to head out, but she's being stalked. Mulder, is that you? Turns out it's just a ghost horse. Yeah, let's just roll with that. Over in another movie, Father Gus is out here shooting some arrows. Personally, I tried archery once, but it wasn't for me. There were just too many drawbacks. And if you thought this was going to be important later, no screenwriter's credit for you. Gus never touches a bow again in this movie. It is nice to see that all these priests have hobbies, though. Emperor Palpatine is over here working on a sweet new spirograph design. Or maybe he's designing a new Death Star without a vulnerable exhaust port. Evan is still looking for his statue with seven eyes, which he finds in the basement. Kinda looks like Cthulhu. He tries to pry it out with a pocket knife, but no dice, so he grabs a pickaxe instead. I love that this guy is supposed to appreciate antiquarian things, but he's all too eager to take a pickaxe to a sculpture that's hundreds of years old. 18 friggin' writers on this movie, and they couldn't come up with an actual reason for him to do this. He finally works free, and it's just an empty hole. Geraldo can relate. Except apparently that was a load-bearing statue because now the whole thing collapses. I don't think this church was built to OSHA standards. And symbolism. Man, looks like that cross was just a facade to hide the most awesome rave in all of Rome. Skrillex is probably playing down there. Evan's now possessed and he opens this bag of jump scares. Oh, it's the bag from Asami's place in Audition. I like it when my cinematic universes collide. Oh wait, I may need to throttle my excitement about that because he's choking himself. Lottie's dad shows up and Evan goes all mob deep on him. Rocked him in his face, stabbed his brain with his nose bone. Over in another movie, Lisa's passed out, but she's awakened by this robocall scam from the IRS. But I don't even live in America. Oh wait, it's just Evan calling during an irritable bowel syndrome flare up. <laughs> Man, he's looking great. 
Fortunately, he doesn't need a doctor because he's just gonna rip out his own heart like this is Temple of Doom. <coughs> Back at Lisa's place, she's having a midnight snack, but she's go to visit her. <coughs> then he breaks the window. <coughs> he is not kidding around. Afraid she's about to suffer a wicked bleat down, she dives out the window. Russian judge gives it a 4.5. Then she flees right into director McKelly Suave, voiced by Edward Mannix. It was Call an ambulance, monster. quick. It's all over now, it's all over. Calm down, we'll take care of everything. You're just lucky we traced your call. We Edward Mannix, voicing McKelly Suave. I think we just hit Sick Flick's Inception. Remember Lottie's dad? Yeah, he's still in this movie. He's been possessed by the spirit of pudgy Phil Collins, apparently. He knew it was gonna happen. He could feel it coming in the air tonight. The next day, Lisa finds Evan writing in his office. Sorry, give me a minute. They needed someone to take another pass on the script and I volunteered. Then they have this riveting conversation. It was a monster. It must have been wearing a mask. I don't think so. Then it gets really weird. <laughs> no means no, Evan. And then she gives him a taste of her pimp hand. You must be crazy! And apparently it's a busy day at the church because we have both a photo shoot and an exposition field trip happening all at once. I read somewhere that the builders of the Gothic cathedrals constructed them in such a way that it was possible to make them collapse by pressing a secret spot. Oh, and some hilarious old people. I can't hear a thing. This contraption doesn't work. Someone get him a jitterbug. Back upstairs, it looks like Evan's draft of the script is coming along great. I mean, it's not on the level of all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, but this is an Italian film. The bar is lower. And he's starting to get real creepy. This where it hurts, huh? 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 <laughs> and that's a really weird place for a bookshelf. She flees and Budget Dennis Haybert is like, Lottie, wait, don't go before I tell you about the safe driver discount at Allstate. Luckily, the fashion shoot needs some help. We wanted to ask your permission to take a few photos. It's so nice in here. Why, yes, thanks to Allstate's generous and affordable home and dwelling coverage, it's totally okay for you to take your photos here. Then it's off to confession. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I'm paying too much for my insurance. It's okay, my child. With Allstate's bundle packages, you get the coverage you need at a price you can afford. Now give me 10 hail, Allstate's. Turns out this is actually pudgy Phil Collins, and things are getting weird. I am no longer the sacristan. I'm not Herman any longer. Last night, the angel of evil possessed me. I hate to punch and run, but I'm late. <laughs> and what is he late for? An important meeting with his pal Jack. Jack Hammer. <laughs> and this sets off the world's first game of Mousetrap. Which locks everyone in the church. Why did you open that damn door? Well? But madam, I told you already, there's nothing I can do. Don't worry though, Palpatine's gonna break this all down for us with a sermon of exposition. Evil in this land has taken the form of monstrous creatures that we call demons. And young Dennis Haysburg calms everyone down. No need for alarm, folks. With all states accident and forgiveness, our rates won't go up because of this mishap. You're in good hands. Father Giovanni Lombardo Radice heads off to make some calls, but he runs into something. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth is it is in heaven. Hey, he can't be dead. He's not allowed to die off screen. There are rules. Back in his office, Palpatine's doing some research. Christ, does anyone respect ancient books in this movie? And don't look now, but this male model's turning into a demon thanks to a scratch he received from Lottie's dad. Then this happens. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, he just got mauled by a murloc. There's a lot going on all at once now, like this biker guy who finds his girlfriend hooking up with this statue. Except it's a hallucination. Where the fuck have you been? I've been looking for you everywhere. Honestly, dude, you might have been better off if she hooked up with the statue. And somehow Phil Collins is alive again, and he's about to make a point. In fact, you could say that's in too deep. Afterwards, everyone's trying to figure out how to escape. This old dude is my spirit animal. Would you care to contribute a little input? I hate that kind of talking, you know it. Why can't you be content to grow old gracefully, old cow?
Then it's time for some more exposition. The Emperor knows there's one Jedi left. Happening is not in God's name, but in Satan's. Or that the devil is responsible for all of this. I'll state guys like, I'm not sure our policy covers acts of God or Satan. Then he basically tosses the Emperor down the shaft of the Death Star. Ah, no! And back upstairs, the old lady is ringing the bell. Her husband was a real headbanger, apparently. In the bowels of the church, our biker couple falls through the floor, and she gets plastered by the subway. Now you know how the bug on your windshield feels. Lisa, who's still in this movie in case you forgot, heads off in search of Evan while this model basically rips her own face off. This is pretty appealing. Of course, Lisa's not looking for him to stop him, she's just looking to hook up so she can basically be Satan's baby mama. Father Gus, meanwhile, is trying to figure out what's next by reading the picture book version of the first act of the script. I don't understand. Then Lottie shows up with an escape ex machina. There's a hole, a crack, down below. Nobody else knows about it. Hey, at least it's set up better than the one in Demons. We're treated to a flashback where we watch the architect of the church get up close and personal with a pair of anguish. And no, that's not a Michigan strawberry joke. That's what they call these things. They head off in search of the architect's tomb, passing this demon Evan getting some action. Then Allstate guy just sort of casually solves a centuries old mystery. Great that the key was just right out here in the main vestibule. And while that's happening, this creepy thing is rising from the basement. <laughs> I'm sure that's no big deal. Father Gus pulls the switch and boom, it's John Cougar Mellencamp time because the walls come tumbling down. He's like, man, I hope we're current on our premiums. And the next day, the church is condemned, but the steeple still stands. And Lottie is still alive. And the seven Eye statue is still there. It flies open, and the demon menace may be loose again. The church is a really weird little film. If you approach it as Demons 3, which it is not, despite all the claims to the contrary, it's a bit disappointing because it takes over an hour to get to the actual demons, and even then the demonic outbreak is nothing like the one in Bava's two films. Instead, with its nods to alchemy, forbidden knowledge, and long buried secrets, the church feels more like a companion piece to Argento's Inferno. If you approach it that way, it's a lot more satisfying. Either way, Suave was a genuine talent who probably was the equal of Mario Bava and Dario Argento. He didn't get to make enough movies to prove that, but the four horror films he did direct are genuine Italian horror classics. It's unfortunate that the church and the sect had to live with the tenuous demons tie-in for years because it gave people false expectations going in. But enough about that. Can Swabby's The Church host a five barf bag sermon on the gospel of gore? Let's go to the gore card! In terms of gross anatomy, the church is pretty middle of the road. This is a film concerned with ideas and themes first, splatter second. And yet, it still delivers some devilish delights. We're treated to a ripped out heart, two impalements, one ripped off face, death by subway, and death by jackhammer. The effects are decent, if a bit understated. The biggest disappointment here? Giovanni Lombardo Radice dies off screen. How does this happen? Despite that, there's enough splatter here to give the church a middle of the road three barf bag rating. As I mentioned, this is a film more interested in ideas and atmosphere over splatter. The gore is just the sauce on the pasta. Looking for more Italian gore? Then be sure to check out my review of the original Demons. You'll find a link here on the screen shortly after you watch all my outtakes. I'll meet you over there. Until next time, I'm Mike Bracken, aka The Horror Geek, bringing you all the splatter that matters. All state guys like, <coughs> oh, God. They head off in search of the architect's tomb, passing this demon Thomas. Oh, mother. And great, they not only have cracks in the foundation, now they've got water. Uh, hi, I'm Mike. I'm another Hooked on Phonics success story.